Aloha mai kako. Aloha wena la. Na kamaina, na kanako, maui nui akama, na pula pula, na uivi, na kupaina. Uh, thank you for that, Jennifer. As she said, we have become good friends. When she comes over now, I, I'm her chauffeur. <laughs> and stand in the background going, you pronounced that wrong. <laughs> but I think she's gotten all the pronunciations pretty, pretty good, pretty good right now. So I am going to talk about um, Hawaiian values, and I probably am going to move around, so I'm going to grab that mic. All right, I'm on mic two now. Thank you. Um, I love being the last to speak because I get to spend all day talking with all of you outside and sitting here and listening to everything that's being said. And... I can pretty say with a fair amount of confidence that I'm not going to tell you anything that you haven't already heard. Because I'm going to talk about Hawaiian values, I'm going to talk about cultural values, I'm talking about just what I see from my lens. Luckily, I don't have, and I'll tell you, I don't have a single fact in what I think I'm going to talk about. You, this room is full of people a thousand times smarter, more eloquent, more dedicated to the work that you do and the life that you've created for yourself doing this work than me. Like Nicole was just saying, I just show up and in three months I'll probably be somewhere else. I told her, don't talk about Mo'olela group. I don't even know what that means. Um, I mean, I know, what, I know what it means. I don't know actually what we do. But I just get to talk about basically the philosophical approach that I saw in Maui, on that day, on the day after, and all the days following. And like I said, they're not going to be new because all of the people here, and I wasn't here yesterday, but all of the people from Maui have already said the words. They're going to talk about, they talked about kuleana, about ohana, about kokua, about all these things, about the importance of aina. I'm just going to repeat things that they've already said as a, as a good little wrap-up, I think. I think that's what I'm going to do, if my slides work. So I'm going to either introduce or talk about a few different things. And, and I'm going to always try, and I tell this to, as a reminder to myself, that I'm going to focus on the positive. And we have an olelo no eao, olelo no eao are our Hawaiian proverbs. This one says, ika olelo ike ola, ika olelo ika make. That in the word there is life and in the word there is death. And we believe that... You can think whatever negative thoughts you want, and it might not do anything. But as soon as they come out of your mouth, they become reality. So in that space between your thought or your na'al and what comes out of your mouth, you have to make a choice of whether to voice it or to not. Because we can spend all day, all life, every moment working on taking care of our community, figuring out a better response, focusing on the negative. And we can waste lifetimes and lives doing so. Or we can recognize that what should come out of our mouth should be spreading life, should be spreading ola, not death. So I ask all of us in this journey, hold me accountable as well, because I will fail all the time to stay in the positive. That is what I see, though, with this group. I also, I know there was a mention, an acknowledgement yesterday, but to recognize our Pomo, our Miwok, and our Wapo Ohana out over here, whose land we stand on. Mahalo to all of you for this. I always think of these lands, as Cecilio and Capono called them, the Yellow Mustard Mountains in one of their songs. If you don't know it, you should check it out. It is a good song. Because I'm going to talk about our lens, at least what I see as our lens. And I have so many people, and I will say this right away, People like Kaliko, like Noelani, like, like our mayor, Rick Bisson, who are more culturally knowledgeable than I am. So any mistakes are mine and mine alone, not my kupuna. Uh, and I acknowledge that as well. Now, we always do something in Hawaii. When a local person meets a local person they don't know, and like Hukui said, they're going to find out they're related somewhere down the line, right? 
But we ask each other three questions, okay? And we can, some would say we go, ovai oi, yeah, who you? And what we're asking is, who's your family, this and that. But local people, if you're kind of part Hawaiian, maybe not, who knows, but we know you're from Hawaii, we ask you three questions. And my local people will know what these, thresh, these three questions are. The first question is, what school you went? Okay, and we're not talking about university, okay? We don't ask what corporation do you work for, what's your startup? No, we go, what school you went? What high school did you go to? Because it places you geographically. It places you within an island, within a part of an island, and within that, it tells us a lot about you. Growing up in our place, and there is a dissonance in Hawaii and in Maui that I don't know if it's been reflected in any other disaster community that's experienced a mega fire. You all, if you're not from the Maui, you, you the Maui, you view Maui perhaps as a world-class destination to travel to. One of the top tourist destinations in the world. A place visited by three million people on our, on our island a year, 10 million across the entire island chain. We who grew up in Maui view it as a small, agrarian, subsistence lifestyle place. We, we see it much differently. We see our home much differently than other people see our home. And that also is part of our culture and affects how we see the world. So we go, oh, what school you went? So we place you geographically. We know a lot about you geographically, right? We place you within space. And then we ask the next question. What's the next question? What year you grad? Okay? See, they're laughing because they know it's true. What year you grad? Okay? Because we want to know what generation you fit in. Are you my generation? Are you my older cousins, my younger cousins, my parents, my grandparents? So now we've not just placed you in space, we've placed you in time. Okay? And now we've got two points in space and time to figure out a co direct connection between me and you, a person I've never met before. And then we ask the third question. Oh, you must know so-and-so. And we find out that you knew my auntie or my uncle or my cousin or my kid because we placed you geographically and temporally. And now there is trust. And many times we've heard today, we in Hawaii, we move at the speed of trust. It's a saying I've heard Uncle Ed Lindsay say before he passed, who was Lahaina, who his son Ekolu often reiterates. And it's something I speak when, when I, I still do uh, cultural, cultural awareness training for all of deployed FEMA workers. That's part of what, what my firm Mo'olelo group does. I tell them, hey, before you go into any meeting, whether it's with a community group, an individual, or, or uh, a government agency, don't, don't go in talking business first. Stop and think about how to find connection. Because it's been said over and over from Lorez and everyone, connection is how it makes it all work. Even if you're not from Hawaii, I encourage you, and that's what I love about what Jennifer has done here and everyone from after the fire, and what she's created, she's created community. She's created points of connection, like a constellation that we can chart our way forward, right? That's what after the fire does, and, and frankly, that's what these disasters have done. They've done them within our own Maui, as Kukui was talking about sitting on the airplane, being with people that are born and raised in Maui that she did not know that have been working in the disaster and now getting to sit at the same, at the same table as them. I get to share about my lens, but make no mistake, there is that here with those native peoples, of this place with the native peoples of your place. And, and I wanna, we will talk more about not just the Hawaiian values, these gnats, but just one, yeah, just one gnat at each table. But I want us to extrapolate a little bit, right, from how you envision, when you hear me say these Hawaiian words and these Hawaiian values, what does it make you think about from your place, right? Because indigenous values can shift how we deal with disasters, right? But 
Indigenous values are different than Western values. Indigenous values are reciprocal. They are always a two-way street. We do not have one-way values. Like we do not have one-way styles of communication. We do not have hierarchical values. Our values are not something over something else. Our values are reciprocal, right? So these indigenous values can shape how we deal with disasters, right? What is our response? But they also shape, as this last panel just talked about, how, just talked about how we deal with how they affect us, right? So all the way through the pipeline from, from you know, initial response, from awareness, from prevention, mitigation, and, and finally recovery, right, we need to apply indigenous values to this. I'm gonna find where I wanna stand at some point. So here's the deal. Culture determines response. We've seen many different responses, and for those people that have worked in this for much longer than I have, right, we see different responses, and those responses are determined by our values, right? Uh, now, our shared values create culture, and here's the deal is that what I love about this, what she's brought together, is a bunch of people that can talk about what values work and what values don't, and then figure out how to apply them, all right? Now, some of the values that I'm gonna talk about are principles, principles that can be applied anywhere, and some of the values are, more, are techniques, right? And there's a difference between strategy and tactics. We, I believe, have some pretty darn good principles, some pretty darn good strategies that can be applied anywhere, whether you're on the East Coast, whether you're in the Gulf, whether you're in the Pacific Northwest, because we figured it out. The same people that sailed across the ocean to land in Hawaii thousands of years before Columbus crossed the sea. These islands we traveled to by ocean, but they were formed by fire. And the concept of a disaster makes it feel like it is not a part of your life. And when Jennifer asked me to speak, and I told her that I didn't want to, because I'm largely out of the work now, she talked about how what she saw, and I apologize if you brought this up, yesterday, um, was she called it a, and I asked her to clarify because it didn't make sense. She goes, when I go into places, I see a startled connection to the land. And I thought she mistyped because I didn't understand, what do you mean a startled connection? She goes, well, most places, when something like this happens, people are, re are once again, or for the first time, have a relationship with the land that they are on. But for indigenous peoples, it wasn't, it's not the same way. And what she saw for the first time in Maui was that we didn't have that startled connection because we were already connected to the land. And we were already connected to the land through Hawaiian culture, whether you are Hawaiian or not, right? And for a lot of you, I know you know Maui and you come here whether even you just stay at the hotel, you get a chance to learn a little bit of Hawaiian culture, thanks to people like Kaliko and every single other local person that works in a hotel or in an activity or attraction and has an opportunity to connect with you. So, in the massively insane learning curve of post-disaster when it comes to you, the first time it comes to you and you get bombarded if you've never worked in government before and you're just a community person like us and you start just being slammed with the acronym soup of everything there is, FEMA this, NDRF that, all these different acronyms coming at you, right? As we start to look for where can I put in the culture, where is it within this place? And I see a lot, we see a lot in Hawaii in certain areas, in setting ground rules, maybe in bringing somebody up to give a land acknowledgement, in offering an opening pule, in perhaps setting a framework with how to interact with an environment, right? How to interact with a people, so when we go into a place, right? But I would encourage us all to think about and I think Coleco might have said a little bit of this earlier, we want a seat at the table. Now it used to be, because we can kind of take disaster 
and apply it to colonization, apply it to modern day Hawaii, right? We used to say, when tourism came to Hawaii, we say, well, Hawaiian culture is like a condiment on the table, one of my teachers would say. He goes, they're like the ketchup on the table. Just make sure ketchup is there and it's cultural enough. Then we got to saying, no, we don't want to be the condiment. We want to be, we want to be at least, we want to be at the table. We want a seat at the table, right? But I truly believe that indigenous values are the table. We should all be sitting at the table of the people of that place, okay? Yeah, and whenever you hear somebody say A-O, that's, that's a good thing. Thank you. Um, I saw this on Instagram just last week about a fire going on somewhere, so I borrowed it over here. Because we need to be the plan, right? And we brought up what is the main obstacle? Well, the obstacle is the system. Well, so let's, let's change the system so the system is indigenous and we're just applying the specific tactics and techniques that we need to, the money, the cash, you know, the pipeline, to fit the indigenous way of thinking, right? So just, just you know, because we're just talking philosophically here, here's a couple thoughts, right? One, culture is based on rites of passage. It's based on ceremony. So when a disaster happens, it, it's, we're not startled into a connection with it. We're already connected. In Hawaii, we are connected to floods through our gods. We're connected to the water through our gods and our mythology. And we are connected to fire in that same way. One of the most amazing rites of passage I've ever heard was, is, a, is a Maori one. Um, and I don't know if Jo Lee is here. She was. So in, in Aotearoa in New, in New Zealand, when in some uh, tribes, when they go away, when the men go away to war and they would come back, they would do something really interesting. And I believe I'm getting this right, but they would crawl through their women's, the, the, a certain uh, female elders of the tribe to enter the village. Because going away to war was essentially leaving the land of the living. Morality was different. The consequences of your actions were different. And returning home, you needed to provide those people, those warriors who'd been away to protect home an opportunity to come back and re-enter life without carrying all that with them. Now, a lot of indigenous cultures has this. Hawaiian has a, Hawaii in some areas had similar ones, right? But when you look at indigenous cultures, especially at these, incidences of PTSD, are basically nil. The opportunity for them to rejoin the community are basically nil. And so when you hear the people that work in these mental health areas, right, even if we don't have something there, what can we do to recreate that opportunity again? What sorts of rites of passage can we use, can we create for our community to be connected in the ways they need to, right? Because when the fire came for us, it was like war, yeah? There was no sleep. It was like we just went out and did what we had to do, okay? And every step away, whether it's in a place or an age, we can create rites of passage in this pipeline of recovery to find a way to, so that you get to be there, right? You get to be present in the space at that time. I've heard a lot of talk about community here, and there's a word I do have to get you guys to say certain words. There's a word that we use a lot, which is ka-ko. Everyone say ka-ko. So ka-ko just means we, but it's an inclusive of the speaker we. So when I say aloha, ka-ko, it means like hello to all of you guys, including myself, right? And many years ago, I was part of a, a, a working group with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. We were working on a framework to connect with the indigenous communities and the Hawaiian community. And uh, another Hawaiian elder, Uncle Walter Ritty, who comes from the island of Molokai, told a story about that island, which is very small and very rural, and all neighbors, people get a lot of baggage, and it's like, you know, there's a lot of history there, right? And they don't always agree on stuff, whether where the fence line should be, 
or what happened when the dog came over and ate your chickens or very big stuff. But when somebody gets married, when somebody passes away, all that goes away. And you know what? You cook food and you show up at the door and you take care of that person. You take care of that family because you know that the we is greater than the me. And too often in our modern society, we will focus on the one thing that sets us apart as trying to figure out the 97 other things that make us in common. We love to do this. We love to focus on the one negative occurrence in our day as opposed to the hundreds of positive occurrences in our day. If we look at it from the philosophy of Ka Ko, right? It says, hey, if you're in pain, I'm in pain because you're part of the collective we. And if you came to Maui during the time directly after the fire, that's what you saw. You didn't see individuals, you didn't see government and community, you did. You saw divisions all over the place. You saw fracturing, you saw infighting, you saw people disagreeing with each other, but it was not as important as the larger goal. It was not as important as the we, right? Because how we do things matters. I'm jumping to the bottom because I just threw them up there randomly. They're not actually in any order. If you guys are big, you know, TEDx kind of TED people, you might have heard of Simon Sinek. And he's got his thing about the golden circle, right? The what, the how, and the why. How many of you guys know that? Okay, a good amount of you, all right? It's like the number one or two watched TED Talks in history. Now, his whole thing went back to Apple and Dell, and it's like Dell focused on what they did. They, we make fans, we make computers. Apple focused on the why, and that's why 80% of you, besides me and Jennifer, have iPhones. We're smart, we have Androids. That was an inside joke. Um, but we focus on the what and the why way too much. We all know the what. You guys are all here for both the what and the why, right? Aloha is the how, because how we do things matters, okay? And I don't know about your individual organizations, but I can tell, I can tell you what, the how matters. How do you approach the situation? How much aloha do you bring to the situation? Are you focusing just on the product or the process? Because the process is the how. It's not just a means to an end, right? So the how, I, I say the how is aloha. Because if you apply aloha to it, then the what and the why will figure themselves out, okay? I got two minutes left. I want to talk about kuleana, and that's it. Um, everyone say the word kuleana. So kuleana means responsibility. And we think about responsibility in, in the Western concept as a negative, right? Oh, it's your responsibility to take out the trash. Oh, it's your responsibility to do the dishes. But in Hawaiian philosophy, kuleana means responsibility, but it also means privilege. Because if you have... If, if it's your responsibility to take out the trash, it means you have the privilege of actually owning physical things. If you have the responsibility to do the dishes, it means that you have the privilege of having food on your plate at your home. And a lot of people don't have that privilege, right? Now, kuleana is not just about what you can do. It's also about what you don't do. And a lot of people today, I believe, both in here and in personal conversations, talked about being aware, being wary of mission drift and knowing what your purpose is here and knowing when it's time to step away, right? If you look up kuleana in the dictionary, in the Hawaiian dictionary, right, you'll see authority, right, because it corresponds back to land, right? It's all about this place. So I encourage you, whenever you go home, I want you to go home and I want you to find out, if you don't know already, who the people of that that place are. Now, because we've seen some really cool stuff. And for the first time ever, and this is something about 
I think this is something about Cal Fire and prescribed burns in California. And I know there's a whole thing on that. Um, and for the first time ever, if, when diving through the NDRF and everything else in FEMA, there's something now they're calling the whole community approach. How many of you guys know about the whole community approach? Now, the best thing I love, this is the first government document I've ever read that has the word philosophical approach. I thought, hey, that kind of sounds like ka ko, okay? If we can apply a ka ko approach to everything, we'd be in a much better place. Uh, I have the privilege of shutting down today. After this, I don't know where you're gonna go, but in Hawaii, when we close a meeting, when we close a conference, on a particular day, all the Hawaii people are worried about what I'm gonna do, we usually end it with a certain thing. So I'm gonna ask everyone to stand up. And look, I made the words for everybody. Hey, I'm, I'm gonna bring you guys up here on stage with me, actually. So if we can have everybody who's outside come inside and everybody make a, just a big circle. All right, so culture is about ceremony. Culture is about doing things. It's not just about talking about things. So um, for those of you who've never heard this, this song, this is something we end with often. And thank you all for playing along with me because there's been a lot of facts. Yeah, that's good. Yes, good, you can. That's actually the protocol. Um, there's been a lot of facts, there's been a lot of emotion, and Hawaii Aloha is about emotion. It's about recognizing our love for our land, but it's also about recognizing our love for those people who stood next to us and continue to stand next to us as we do the things we need to do. So if you can tell, we just go one, two, three, down this thing over here, and all the Hawaii people can sing loud with me. This is the short version. No, I don't even have, I only have first verse and then the two choruses, see? Jennifer's husband, you're summoned in here. Yeah, this is the whole Lilo and Stitch Ohana thing. No one, no one left behind. Mary, are you ready? I know you can sing good. The words are up there, so you can sing along.
Mahalo. <laughs>